As we start the new year off, I want to do a couple things right here at the beginning of the year. I want to restate to you what the vision of our church is here at Gospel Presbyterian Church. What is it that we're about? What are we actually doing here? What's the big idea behind this whole thing? And then also I want to talk about, in the second part, about how you actually fit into that grand plan. What your role is in the church at large, even as an individual, as a family, etc. So kind of two parts. One, restating what our vision is here. Why are we here? Why are we doing what we're doing here with GPC in Utah? And number two, how each one of you has a place within that broader and larger vision. We're going to look at that this morning. When Brian and I were juniors together at Covenant College, uh, the year he transferred there, I was there for two years already, we got to know know each other our junior year at Covenant College. And uh, we were both... part of starting a prayer group that we later came to call the Upper Room. We called it the Upper Room just because we literally met in an upper room at a, in the science building, which happened to be open late. They would leave it open for us. They would let us meet there. Uh, we'd meet there at 10 p.m., one or two nights a week, and just begin to pray on our knees. A number of men would get together, and we would open up our Bibles when we came together in that room. We would get on our knees, and we'd begin to seek the face of God. And people would would read large portions of Scripture, passages from the Psalms, passages from the New Testament, passages from Isaiah, and would begin to give us a passion and a vision for the mission of God in the world. As we began to pray, all the... All the little things that we thought mattered, our class schedule, or I didn't get that class in this time, or I wonder if that girl likes me, all those kind of things began to fade into the background. And the grand mission and vision and glory of God began to arise in our hearts and our minds as we realized that as we went out from this place, that was this four years at Covenant College, we wanted to see God do great things. And we were willing in those times, in those moments, to be used of him in any way he saw fit. We were very inconsistent, (laughs) you know, the other days of the week, etc. Sometimes we had to refocus. We would become depressed. We would lose that vision. But then we would get back into the upper room. We would get on our knees. We would open our Bibles again. We would regain that vision of God's glory here on the earth. We didn't know the specifics at the time, of course. We never dreamed that we would end up in Utah together. (laughs) Along the way, God God added to us two godly wives, Kelly and then Melanie, who was also at Covenant College. And, And he began to form something in his own mind before it had ever occurred to our minds. So what I want to emphasize there is that, yes, it's through the prayer and the word that these visions come. And in a sense, this is the antecedent to the vision of GPC here. But it is God's heart, it is God's vision first when it's a spiritual vision, before it becomes your vision or before you join a vision. In a sense, we we joined a vision, a vision for church planting, a vision for the kingdom of God to advance over this earth, and for the glory of the Lord to cover the earth like the waters cover the seas. Because we read that in the Bible, we found it there in Isaiah. We found it there in the Psalms, and we said, Lord, what you're talking about here, we want to see happen. And then the specifics begin to come together. Okay, then we were called to Utah, etc. It started before that even in my own life. I was 15, and I was doing evangelism on the streets of Fort Lauderdale, Florida, which is where I was for high school. And we were taught under a particular program called EE, Evangelism Explosion. So they gave you a little outline, and you would ask some people some questions, and then you would share the gospel with them. You know, And every time I did it, it was failing at that part. I never saw anyone come to faith in Christ or converted when I was 15 and doing that. And the reason was because I was unconverted. I didn't really know Christ as my own Savior. I didn't really know what it meant to repent of my sins and to surrender myself wholeheartedly to him. Even though I'd go into church every Sunday, and I was even there with other buddies who were part of this program, sharing the gospel with people on the streets. It began with a failure in my own life 
that would that the Lord would actually use. Because even though I shared the gospel with others, I realized, you know, I'm not repenting. I might do this on Thursday nights, I might be at church on Sunday mornings, but that's not really the life I'm living in between. I'm not repenting of my sins and surrendering my life wholeheartedly to the Lord. That hit me at 17 one night, and I was converted. After that, the Lord began to open up more and more visions of what life was to be like. This happens in different ways for different people. But in my life, I went on a missions trip to Belize, and we began to share the gospel with people on the streets there, just like we had done in Fort Lauderdale, you know, the year, year and a half before when I was failing. But this time, something was different. I was converted, and then I was doing it, and then we led some people to Christ, and they actually wanted to receive Christ as their Savior. And that just blew my mind. The gospel actually works. I mean, you can share the message of Christianity with someone else in their life, and they can hear it and be changed by the gospel, and then they become Christians too. Wow, that's amazing. That vision began to grip me. Later it evolved into being a pastor and church planning. That doesn't happen for everyone. Each person fulfills that vision of God's glory in different ways in their lives. But it always starts in the same way, in a sense. And there's always the same elements that are there. The vision of God's glory and a passion that comes from that vision to do the mission of God. So you have the vision, and then the mission comes before your eyes as you fulfill it with a passion. Now we often say, say here at GPC our, our vision or our purpose, our goal, however you want to put it, is to help people take the next step in their walk with Christ. And that comes from Colossians 2.6 where Paul says to the Colossian church that he had helped to found and is now encouraging through this letter to them. He reminds them of something and then he encourages them. Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord... So walk in him. That has a continuing sense in the Greek there. So as you received, past, the Christ Jesus the Lord, so continue to walk in him. In other words, continue that walk with Christ forward. You need to take the next step in your walk with Christ. And in a sense, that's, that's our goal, our vision of a church, because it applies to each person. Maybe someone comes here this morning and they don't have a walk with Christ. The challenge is that you need to begin that walk with Christ through repenting of your sins and surrendering your life to Jesus Christ as your King and Savior. For those of you who come and you've had that walk with Christ for many years perhaps, there is always a challenge to take the next step. Maybe, maybe last year you became a Christian. You've been a Christian for a couple years now, and you know that you need to grow. You know that there are definite next steps that you need to take in your life. I, I want to be consistent in reading the Word of God and praying each day, and I want to grow in my understanding of who God is by, by reading through the whole Bible because I've never done that before. Others have been Christians for 20 years. And yet the challenge is always still there to take the next step, even for you. You're not off the hook. Everyone has a next step to take in their walk with Christ. And I want to emphasize something as I talk about that. When we say we're challenging people to take the next step in their walk with Christ, I'm not saying necessarily that you're just climbing the ladder of church holiness or something like that. You know, there's... Well, you know, you could always give more, you could always give more time, or you could... Always, no, no, no. That's not what I'm talking about. We said the next step in your walk with Christ, that personal relationship. Because that personal relationship you have with Christ is where everything else flows out of. Your gifts that you use to serve. Yes, what you want to give, money, time-wise. Your worship of the Lord. How excited you are about the Lord when you come to worship Him on Sunday morning. Everything else is related to that personal relationship with Christ. So if that goes down, everything else goes down. If that goes up, everything else goes up as well. Your joy, your peace, your love for others, your concern for the unsaved, your concern for the poor, for unwed mothers of children or orphans in Uganda or, you know, 
the polygamists who are coming out of polygamy and need help. All those kinds of things. You have passions on your heart for the Lord when you're walking with Christ and when your heart becomes like Jesus' heart. It's often through failure that you learn those lessons, just like I sort of learned the failure lesson in, in regards to evangelism. But then the Lord gave me, as I was looking at church planting, a passion for Utah, the state of Utah. When I heard that there were less evangelical Christians in Utah, percentage-wise, than in Egypt, that struck me. And I said, wow, this is a place that needs the gospel. There are very few churches in Utah, historically, that are preaching the word of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ. I knew that it was a place that needed the gospel. And the Lord began to move myself and Kelly as well in the direction of Utah. That's where we came out the fall of 2010 to begin GPC. We were working at another church for a little while, and then the beginning of 2012 is when we moved to really begin this church in earnest. Later that spring, 2012, also Brian and Melanie came out and joined us. Some of you were, some of you kind of watched that from the beginning, and some of you sort of come a little bit later. But that's sort of, the, sort of our back story as we think about what God is doing here in our midst today. My goal as a planter was to start an evangelical Presbyterian church that eventually would be self-supporting, self-governing, and self-propagating, which means you help start other churches as well. With the end result, and this is something we constantly emphasize as well, that at the end of the day, there would be more people worshiping Jesus here than when we started. With the end result, that at the end of the day, there would be more people worshiping Jesus than when we started. Because that's what it's ultimately all about. His glory. That's why we do what we do. That's why we want to help people take that first step in their walk with Christ and take the next step. All of that, everything that we do here, worship, discipleship, evangelism, mercy ministry, helping the poor, etc. All those things are for the purpose of God's glory in the world. And as I said in my prayer, we know that Jesus is coming back again one day. We, already, we just celebrated Christmas, right? His first coming, the first coming of Christ. That's what they call that. There's also something called the second coming of Christ, where he's going to come back again one day. And again, it could be a thousand years from now. It could be tonight. But how will he find you? Will he find you, first of all, in a relationship with him by grace? Also, will he find you working somewhere for him? Or just slacking off or what how will he find us how will he find us as a church as well it's an important question that we all must ask our heart here is to see many many people here in utah and especially in this little corner of the valley here who do not know god begin their walk with jesus christ for the first time and for those who have already begun their walk with christ to be challenged to take the next step and to continue to continue on that journey. You know, it says one time in the scripture that Jesus was up on a hill and he was looking out over Jerusalem. And it says that as he looked out over the Jews who were there in Jerusalem, he says that he saw them as a sheep as like sheep without a shepherd. And it says that he looked with compassion upon them and he wept because he said that they were like sheep without a shepherd. In a, same, in a sense, we must have that same vision as Jesus did as we look over this valley to see all the people that are like sheep without a shepherd and to weep over them and to have compassion. Because unless we do that, then you won't care. You won't care that people are going to hell every single day when you see a funeral go by and the chances are that that person is in hell right now because they died not knowing Christ and did not go to heaven. They went to hell. When we begin to realize what the Bible says is true, it will give us that sense of compassion. There was a Scottish pastor named Robert Murray McShane who was in Scotland, in Dundee, Scotland, at a Presbyterian church there. And he was used mildly of the Lord to preach to his congregation and lead them in revival and, and also to preach in other places and, and bring about revival as he simply preached the word of God in a powerful way. And many people were able to come to Christ. 
He was a young man and only labored for a few years before he died of illness, but reached many, many souls throughout Scotland and other places as well. But do you know where that, that great ministry and that great compassion for the lost and that effectiveness that he had came from? It's evidence in a story that someone told of, of an older couple who was visiting his home church many years later after he had died. And the old curator there, an old lady who kept the church, she was sort of a janitor and, and kept the doors locked and opened, that kind of thing. But she had known Machane personally. And as the couple was coming in, sort of touring that very famous church there in Dundee, they were looking around, that's the pulpit where Machane preached, you know, and this is, the congregation is still here and is alive and healthy. And uh, she said, now, if you want the real experience, go over there and sit at that little desk that's in the corner there. And open up the Bible that's there, just like Machane used to do. And now put your head in your hands and begin to weep, just like Machane did. And that's where it all started for him in that specific context. Weeping as he read the word of God and weeping over the lost. Just like Jesus says, it says that he wept and he looked upon them with compassion. We must have that same sense of purpose and of vision and of motivation when we're here in Utah where the vast majority of people do not know Christ as their savior. We must look upon them as sheep without a shepherd and yearn for them to come to know Christ. Yearn for them to hear the gospel. Maybe the Lord will use you in some way in that respect. And that transitions into the second part of this sermon, which is, that's the vision of our church, helping people take the next step in their walk with Christ. That's a very simple thing you can memorize, you can hold on to, and you can be a part of every single day, actually. Because you're sort of doing that yourself, right? We as a church are hopefully helping you as members do that. But then you're also helping other members do that, and even people who don't even come to this church to maybe take that first step, right? So that's something, that's a vision that you can be a part of every day, helping people take the next step in their walk with Christ. It's just a little, maybe it's just a little step. You know, it's not the moon or something. You don't go from zero to whatever in a day. But it's just that next step. Now that said, how do you fit into the vision of the church? And this is something that we've talked a lot about in the past. But the Bible says that each person has been given unique spiritual gifts to serve in the kingdom of God. When you become a Christian, the Holy Spirit gives you a spiritual gift, and that is a gift that you can use to serve in a specific way in the kingdom of God. The sad thing is many people don't know their spiritual gifts because they don't know them, they're not using them effectively. It says this in, you can look at 1 Peter 4, the scripture that's already printed for you there as well, where it it talks about this as well. You can see how it says God has given each a gift. And there's two categories it talks about there in 1 Peter 4. If it's a speaking gift, you should speak as one who speaks the very oracles of God, it says. If God has given you the gift of serving, you should serve as one serving in the strength that God provides. Sort of two generic categories there, speaking and serving. And within the speaking, there's some who are more focused, like the New Testament evangelists, Philip and Stephen and these others, Paul even, who are focused on reaching the lost with their words so that they become Christians, evangelism. And there's those who are focused more on doctrine, instruction, often Peter's this way. Of course, Paul does that as well. But there's those gifts more focused on teaching as well. And Paul talks about those in Romans chapter 12 when he talks about the gifts of teaching that have been given to the church as well. Even in Ephesians 4, he says, And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So he's given the evangelists, you see, he's given the teachers. Then Peter talks about serving as well. Those are the ways that you use God's grace in your life to serve others. And if you're not, there's a serious, serious problem. Many people think this in their Christian life. Well, I'll read my Bible, I'll go to church, I'll take communion, 
and I'll sing God's praises when the singing time comes. And that way I'll just be a Christian. And maybe I'll even grow as a Christian as I'm doing that, right? They're leaving out something very significant, which is serving the Lord with your spiritual gift. Serving the Lord with your spiritual gift is not only a part of how you actually be a Christian, it's part of it by definition. You're walking in Jesus' footsteps of service and love, but it's also how you grow as a Christian as well. As you step out in faith, doing something you would not normally do because the Holy Spirit has filled you, he's given you the gift at the beginning, you begin to discover it, you're developing that gift, and now you're deploying it for his kingdom service, and you step out in faith, God will meet you there with his grace, and he will grow you in ways you could not even fathom. And he will certainly grow you in ways that you could not achieve by just sitting on the couch or just sitting in the pew, those seats. You have to step out in faith, and you will grow, and it's part of the definition of what it means to be a Christian. Jesus said, if you are my disciples, you'll do what I'm doing. (laughs) What did Jesus do? He was reaching the lost. He was growing his disciples. He was helping the poor, healing people, helping people, evangelism, teaching, mercy ministry, or service. Uh, Of course, I've challenged many of you in the past to think about which of those three categories your spiritual gift is in. Has the Lord given you a passion and, and now gifting for reaching the lost and bringing them into Christianity for the first time? Or is it more in the area of teaching and discipleship, where whether it's in front of a class or more a one-on-one setting, you want to see Christians grow in their faith and you love doctrinal ideas and teaching people the scriptures so that they learn concepts and can also become obedient. You exhort them, you help them, you encourage them to grow in their faith. Or are you more in the area of serving where you love just to work with your hands behind the scenes and if nobody knows, that's okay. I just love to, to use my hands to serve the Lord. That's the serving area. All of those are equally dignified in God's sight and are all important ways that the church works together to fulfill that grand vision of God. And it's certainly what I want here at GPC. If you're a member here, each one of you to know your gifts and to be using them to serve the Lord. Brian and I pray for each of you specifically, we think about you specifically, to see those gifts develop in your life, and for you to put those to practice in your life, in your family, in the community, and in the church as well. It's certainly something we want you to think about and grow in. I sort of give this analogy, and this this was given to me by Dr. K, who's been here before, when he talks about the spiritual gifts. He says, you think about a doctor's office at times, and uh, maybe, it's a, maybe it's a general family practice that they have there. And at this particular doctor's office, there's one OBGYN. That doctor is in charge of bringing babies into the world, delivery, so to speak. Kind of corresponds to the evangelist. Then maybe for every one OBGYN who's bringing the babies in for the first time, then you have two pediatricians who are in charge of seeing those kids grow, right? After, they, after the babies are born, for example, when we just had Judah, you know, they said, well, you're done with the OBGYN, in a sense. Now you need to get a pediatrician. The pediatrician does everything in their power, of course, to oversee the growth of those children, that they stay healthy as they're growing, growing, growing. But for every one OBGYN and two pediatricians that you have running the office there for the kids, etc., you also have three nurses or office workers who are making sure all the bills get paid and are helping with all the other basic things, running everything smoothly together. The whole office runs smoothly. Have you ever seen doctors' handwriting or other organizational skills at times? They would not, they would not make it without those people, those nurses, and those office administrators who are making the whole thing actually run and the doors stay open and the light bill get paid, etc. So all those things are necessary even for a doctor's office to run, right? Let alone for a church to run. We need the evangelist who's bringing in people for the first time. And he's leading the charge in a sense. There might be a team of others who are not evangelists who are, who are sort of under his charges, he leads the charge in the evangelism area, so to speak. It's not as though he's the only person who does it. Same with teaching. The teachers, those gifted, are leading the charge in the area of teaching and discipleship. You know, someone might be a servant or a deacon, but they're actually doing things in that area, led by the charge of those who are actually teachers. Same with the servants or the deacons. 
They're the ones who are leading the charge and say, you know what, hey, we need, to, we need to get a group together and go, again, feed the homeless downtown. We need to get some clothes together. We need to help this person in our church who's really struggling right now. And nobody even knew it. They're really sick and now they have financial difficulties. We need to help that person. The deacon is concerned with those practical things like that. Mercy ministries, the physical needs of the church as well. Maybe helping the finances run, helping with the food, etc. And they lead the charge in that area, and others can be part of the charge. So we're all required to do all of those things as a matter of obedience. We all evangelize, we all teach and disciple, and we all serve. Even if you have kids, right? You have to do all these things. You have to lead them to Christ, you have to teach them, and you have to serve in so many ways, right? So we all do all three. But the ones who are gifted in those areas lead the charge, so to speak. So I might be the evangelist. I lead the charge when it comes to evangelism, door-to-door, those kind of things. Ryan might be more teaching-oriented, so he leads the charge often with microgroups or thinking about things. And we, follow, we follow in his footsteps. And then someone else leads in the area of service. We follow them. We say, yeah, we're going to go downtown and feed the homeless this weekend. Okay. If not the evangelist and he's the teacher, we go downtown. We follow the charge. So we all do all three, but those who are gifted in those areas lead the charge. This is the specific ways we look at 1 Peter 4, Ephesians 4, and Romans 12 when it talks about spiritual giftings that you continue to be a part of the grand vision of this church, which is ultimately the vision of God for Utah. And I believe that he has a heart for Utah, and he has something that he's doing here in our midst to advance the kingdom of God and to bring his glory about in this place. The steps for you personally are first to discover, three Ds, discover your spiritual gift. You do that by serving in different ways. Intentionally go and do something that is evangelistic, even if it's uncomfortable. Intentionally go and put yourself in a teaching, exhorting, discipling context to see if that's your gift. Intentionally put yourself in a serving situation if you don't like serving, just to see if those are your gifts. Again, we all have to do all three. But intentionally go and do all three of those things constantly in the beginning to see which area you begin to have an attraction more towards and what area you begin to excel in. See, because if you're serving in the church and in the kingdom of God in an area that's not your gift area, primarily, that's where you're using all of your time and talent, so to speak, you'll be unhappy in the end and unproductive. But when you're serving in an area that is your spiritual gift, your spiritual realm of expertise, then you'll be happy in your service and effective. And that's what we want for each person, of course. You have first have to discover your spiritual gift. Then you have to develop it. Maybe those who are already in that area are sort of training you. Now I'm going to give you a chance to teach this microgroup this week, whatever. They're giving you an opportunity to grow and to develop those gifts. And eventually, when you're certified in that gift area, then you're deploying your spiritual gifts on a regular basis. And that will really grow the kingdom of God. Wherever you are, whatever you're doing. Discover, develop, and deploy your spiritual gifts. That's the way that you individually, especially, fit into the grand vision of God's kingdom. But we all, of course, all do those things together as well. We all evangelize, we all teach, and we all serve, which are the three basic ways that we do ministry. And you'll see that reflected in this church. What are the four basic things that we do in the church? Worship which is sort of a roof over those three things. Worship, and then evangelism, teaching, service. Those are three main areas of ministry in any church under the roof of worship. You worship in all those things, but especially on Sunday mornings, right? So those are, those are the ways that we're involved in that grand vision, which is the vision not just of this church, but really is the vision of any church to advance the glory of God. We specialize in those areas, but we all do those things. What, what would happen in a church, I'll conclude with this, what would happen in a church if we're not doing those things? If we're not using our spiritual gifts to serve the Lord, if the evangelists are not active in a church, what will happen in that church? I'll tell you what will happen. New believers are not being brought into the church. You're not seeing conversions in a church. That, in turn, discourages everyone else, and the church begins to become stale and stagnant. 
even over the course of many years, can die. When the evangelists are not in place doing their work. What happens when you don't have the teachers who are at work? When good teachers who are not searching out the scriptures are teaching all the people the word of God every day? What happens when there's not real discipleship happening? People who are even believers begin to go astray in two areas. One in the area of doctrine, they become heretics. You can actually have heresy, which is wrong teaching in a church. Wrong teaching does not glorify God because it's a lie. It's against the word of God. People even who are Christians in the church begin to believe things that are not from the Bible. How could that happen? Because people are not teaching them the word of God. See, that's one of the areas. And then the area of discipleship. People might even know their stuff because maybe there's teachers who are teaching some, but there's not exhorters who are actually encouraging them to grow in their faith. So people might even know things intellectually from the word of God, but they're not actually growing in their walk with Christ because they're not being encouraged in the spiritual disciplines. They're not being exhorted to repent and believe daily, to be in the word of God in prayer daily. So when the teachers are not active, you have a darth of good teaching and discipleship in the church which also can severely damage a church. What happens when you don't have deacons or servants who are at work? (laughs) Everything just falls apart, of course. Everything just falls apart. Nothing is happening in regards to helping the poor. Nothing is happening in regards to caring for the physical needs of the members. And the whole thing in, in general is a mess because the deacons are not there to organize things, the servants. What would happen if we don't do those things? My final analogy, we looked at in Genesis the story of Noah who was building the ark and then the flood came. But before that, he was doing something. He was building the ark and then we also presume from other texts that talk about this, he's also trying to invite others into the ark as well. And in a sense, that's an analogy of what we're doing here in this church plant. You are like Noah and we are building an ark here. The flood of God's wrath is coming to this earth one day. Jesus will come back, and he will bring with him his recompense for the wicked, which is punishment, but also he will bring the reward of the righteous. The flood is coming. You're Noah. You're building an ark here that is this church plant, GPC. You do have to build the ark itself. We're growing, developing ourselves, but we're also going out to people and saying, hey, you need to come into the ark. You need to come in. This is the only place that you can have salvation in Jesus Christ's body, in the word of God. That's why we have that little card, right? You're inviting others to come into the ark. It's a vision that must be shared. All of us have come on board with the vision, so to speak. We're all now part of the church, but you're also inviting others to come into the ark, to escape the floodwaters of God's wrath, to escape that life which is hell on earth of not actually living in the presence of God, of not knowing God, of not experiencing His grace and salvation daily in life. We have to invite others just like Noah did as well. Because whether we do or not, Jesus is going to come again one day. And He could he could come back a year from now and say, yeah, you guys didn't, you didn't really do a good job. I mean, you're my children, but you didn't really do a good job of bringing people into the ark or of building the ark itself, the church. On the other hand, we want to see him come to find us working under the banner of that vision of his glory, using your spiritual gifts every single day so that when he comes back or when he calls you home, he will look you in the face and say to you, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into the rest of your master.